So I know um, some of you guys, many of you probably heard me talk about uh, these stories. And I'll tell you a story. It's a, it's a, it is another hypothetical story of a hypothetical uh, family. Uh, and the hypothetical family, uh, the husband and wife, and they have a hypothetical child, uh, let's say. Uh, and so, one day, this child, um, she likes to, uh, I, I mean, that's she, she's just a general, she, 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 he or she, I'm not saying it's a boy or girl. Uh, but this child likes to uh, uh, push the boundaries a little bit. And sometimes this child, uh, she does that, or he does that, whatever it doesn't matter, uh, does that by, uh, in small ways and in big ways, right? In small ways, this child might, you know, uh, she knows she's not supposed to pick her nose, but she picks her nose and then she'll look at her parents and be like, what are they watching? Or, you know, when their parents uh, say, uh, the child, please pick up this thing off the floor, uh, and of course the words out of the child's mouth are no, and then she'll look, the child will look at the parents and go, they look, are they looking at anyone and say no? What's their reaction like? And then sometimes this child will maybe act, not intentionally of course, but maybe make a big mistake. Like let's just say they were, I don't know, sitting at the dining room table and coloring on some book and then their hand hits a glass of water and that water spills across the entire table and gets in water on her father's laptop. Hypothetically. So let's say that water falls on a laptop, and of course, the father is already upset, right? Because she, this child knows that you're not supposed to like sit on the table, or you know, that you're supposed to sit in the chair and call the table, but for some reason, this child decides to like sprawl across the table. When she did that, she knocks over the glass. And so she knows she, this child knows that there's something wrong and upset his, or his, his father. And so, uh, when the child looks back at the father, this time though, what do you think is the look on the child's face? Is it smiling like, oh, he, I mean, cute, is it smiling like that? What do you think is the look on the child's face? Is? A little more sad. I realize that, oh, it's not like a small mistake that I did. Because sometimes they do that, right? Sometimes babies do that. Um, uh, I'm not saying it's a baby, I'm saying like small children who are not here. Even some of adults do this sometimes too, right? They kind of hold in front of each other, not to seriously annoy each other, not to seriously cause any harm. When they have any kind of bad, um, any kind of bad reason on your mind, but just because kids do the test of battery a little bit. So she does that uh, once in a while as just to test the battery, see what I can get away with, and look and see if I can try to play it off as being playful. But this one big mistake, this child realized, oh, this is worse than the other thing. This is worse than me playing around. This is worse than me like trying to be, um, uh, you know. Hypothetically, they, they might call this child a chakandi or something. So hypothetically, um, not being like a regular everyday chakandi, but being like a big, you know, maybe big mistake. And so instead of being playful and smiling, the child looks back at the parents and is no longer smiling anymore, but is actually genuinely sad. Or genuinely, not maybe not even sad, more like scared, worried. What's the reaction going to be? And so then at this moment, even though internally this hypothetical father is filled with all sorts of rage because his computer is not covered in water, then he has a choice. I can, or sorry, he can react. <laughs> There's a choice in it. He can react in two different ways. One way could be to scold, to yell, to get angry. Which is, it's just not, like it's not an unnatural reaction. You can all imagine it, right? A child uh, accidentally does some damage and the first instinct you, you, you have a little bit of anger. And you want to, uh, you know? And then, then the other way, the other option though, is if you take a minute and look at it from maybe the other person's perspective, the child's perspective. And imagine that, and look at the fact, what was the kid actually trying to do? Maybe the kid wasn't actually trying to sprawl across the table because uh, it wanted, she wanted um, to make a mess. Maybe one of her crayons had rolled over behind the glass of water and she just wanted to reach over to get it. But because she's a small child, she's not good at reaching out and grabbing the thing. Right? Uh, or something like that. Maybe we don't know maybe what, what the reason is. Maybe that could be a hypothetical situation. Who knows what was there? But whatever the reason was. And then so if, if the father uh, was calm and kind of looked at what happened, okay. 
already realize a child knows they did something wrong and is scared at that moment, is genuinely afraid, how is this person going to react? And so then, if the father goes that way and says, yeah, I'm not going to yell or scream, I'm going to be like, alright, it's okay, it's a mistake, it happens, let's clean it up together, let's show it yourself. We spill some water on the table, it's okay, let's clean it up, let's make sure that that is computer is okay, and we know that his computer is fine, and it's real. Um, but then, you know, there's, it could have gone one of two ways. If, if the father would react the other way, allowing the anger to get a, get a hold of him, that fear would have even been amplified even more. And would have been an internal, that, that it, it would almost be almost a traumatic experience for this kid. Whereas if you try to make it into a positive teaching moment, where he said, you know, this is what happens when we spill water on the table, let's clean it up now, and involve the kid in the cleanup, and then it becomes more of an educational teaching moment, what I can say. And so, this is one little snapshot of a day in life, a hypothetical family, but think about our lives, our day to day our daily basis, and that doesn't have to be for little kids. People make mistakes all the time. That's just who we are. People make mistakes all the time. On a daily basis. And sometimes we're the ones who make that mistake. And the person that runs through your mind when you make a mistake is, oh, shucks. What did I do? And then there's a bit of fear. And some of that fear is, oh, what if I get caught? What if someone sees me? What if I get found out? Another thing is, like, well, how do I go and make this, make this right? And you have a genuine concern for making things right again. And maybe sometimes you're not the one who made a mistake. Maybe sometimes you're the one whose mistake is made too. Maybe someone else made a mistake too or treated you in a way that you didn't like. And you have a choice. That person probably already has a little bit of fear in them anyway because of what happened. They already feel bad. There's no point in making them feel worse about it. This is exactly what's happening here. This passage we've read before many times, and if you were at the prayer meeting with me a couple weeks ago, I talked about this exact same passage. Where well, this is a very familiar one where Christ talks to Peter three times and says, Do you love me? And the church father stated the reason he says three times, specifically three times, Do you love me? And Peter says, Yes, three times I love you. Then he's making up for the three times when Peter did what else? Denied yeah. yeah. him three times. When Christ was in front of the Sanhedrin, he was sitting outside and he was watching, and Peter kept him saying, Hey, is that your master? Is that your teacher? Weren't you one of his followers? He said, I don't know. And he said, Three times, at that third time, the rooster crowed. And then he felt what? Bad. He felt guilty. And you, don't you think? Remember a couple of weeks ago when Arnold Thomas was here and he talked about what is the most vivid memory in your head? Don't you think that time was the most vivid memory in Peter's head? That all he could remember was the fact that Christ was born through all the suffering and was crucified. Yeah, he resurrected. But think about before that, he crucified and all he did, the last thing he, the last witness he bore for Christ was to die in three times. And the rooster crowed and it cut him to the heart. And the same thing here. Three times Christ asked him to be loved. Why? Because Christ could have said that to anybody else. He had 11 other or 10 others to choose from. He could have said that to anyone the other time. He gave Peter a way to come back. He gave Peter a way to come back. And he said, you know what? I know you felt bad about this. So come on back. Tell me that you love me. Make up for the mistake you made before. And at that third time, the reason why he was grieved, I said this before, which I was talking about, not only is because Christ asked him three times, but because it reminded him, oh, it's the third time that we should quote before. And here's that at the third time he realized what had happened. But it's a good thing because Christ came that way back. And so many times people are going to come and they're going to make a mistake. And it's going to happen to them. They might be the same person all the time. But there's a reason why Christ said, How many times should I forgive my brother? Should I forgive you seven times? No, seven times, seven. We don't forgive each other just one time and let it be. For each of us, sometimes we just need a way back. We need someone not to treat us with hate, someone not to treat us with even sarcasm, someone not to treat us as we're little children, or to talk down to us, but just give us a way to come back. Many times that's the reason why our families 
and our friend that I love this can't reconcile. It's true. The person who made a mistake should go and apologize. But this other person who was wrong should give them the opportunity to make the apology instead of closing all the doors and say, forget that. Genuinely, people want to reconcile. I believe that wholeheartedly. Anyone who makes a mistake knows they made a mistake and they want to reconcile. But if they're not given that avenue, if they're not given a road to reconciliation, they're not going to take it. And so it's up to us. We have a responsibility ourselves. If we're the ones who have been wrong, if someone wrongs us, it's our job, our responsibility to make sure they have a way to come back to us. Offer them a hand. If you offer someone your hand and they reject it, that's their problem. But you did what you were supposed to do. You have lent out your hand to come back to me. Tell me that you love me. Let's work this out. Let's reconcile. But if they turn your hand down, then they don't want reconciliation. We have to provide that reconciliation to other people. Without any kind of scorn, without making them feel guilty. Reconciliation doesn't mean, you remember that time you said you wronged me? Oh yeah, let's work on that. No. It's about taking away that guilt. It's about taking away sarcasm, taking away making someone feel bad. They feel bad as it is. That's what you've heard that term, we're kicking someone when they're down. We don't do that. Christ didn't do that. Christ didn't say, hey, Peter, remember that time when I was getting beaten? Remember that time when I was suffering for you? Do you remember that time when they hung me on the cross and you denied me? Do you want to work on that right now? Let's work on that. He didn't say any of that. He said, here, Peter, have some breakfast. Do you like me? We have to genuinely think about if we want reconciliation, how do we offer that reconciliation to other people? It's important for us, those of us who do make mistakes, it's very important for us to go seek reconciliation. We should. If we make a mistake, we've made we make we wronged somebody, we should go and seek reconciliation. But if we're the ones who have been wrong, we should equally give that person a chance of reconciliation without guilt, without holding anything over them. That's the model that Christ is showing us. There's one more thing I want us to keep in mind as we continue to provide is that many of you have heard, this is the, we talked about it in the past few days that um, 100 years ago, this 100 year anniversary of the uh, Armenian genocide, uh, 1.5 million, 1.5 million Armenians were killed. And they're being martyred, they're being, uh, there's special service this week and all the heads of all the churches, including our Baal Jimmy and, uh, and the patriarch, they all got together. And if you, everyone probably has faith when you look at the Facebook pictures and you saw all the traditions coming together, and you actually saw the patriarch and Baal Jimmy and Katholiko kind of sitting together and laughing and having a good time. And it's, it's a very beautiful thing to see that there's actually like some sort of brotherhood is there. And so all these churches kind of came together and they're having these special services to elevate these fallen 1.5 million, 1.5 million people to the, to the status of being martyrs because they were killed for being Christians. And they're our brothers and sisters. They're Armenian Christians. They're our sister church. And so we remember them today through this liturgy. At the same time, we're also aware of the news that's been going on that many people have died or are suffering now in the Middle East, in Africa, Ethiopia, uh, in Eritrea, and especially in um, Syria. And even now in Nepal, if you guys have heard most recently, in Nepal, the very northern part of India, where the earthquake, and the death toll most recently I saw was something like 1,500 people. So we have to, we live in a very fragile world. We live in a world where, to, where one day today we're living in a brick concrete structure, and tomorrow that concrete structure is falling down over us. And so we never know what's going to happen. So pray for all those who are departed, and pray for all those who are suffering and now. All those millions of people who are homeless. And also all those people who have lost their lives. And these, especially these glorious martyrs who have died for their faith and died for Christ, so they receive the crown of glory. And may their prayers help us to follow in their footsteps. We pray for them. And again, we never know what tomorrow holds. So don't let the sun set on an argument. If you're a husband and wife, brother, sister, friend, do not let the sun set on the argument. Because you don't know if you're going to see sunrise tomorrow. So give the other person the opportunity to come back. All praise and thanks to you, Jesus, blessed Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and always, and forever. Amen.